I'm going to talk about the way in which we have and you can use biological data to answer social science research questions. And so the way we in Understanding Society have combined those bi biological and, and social data. So I have, because I was trying to work out how to fit this all into 90 minutes, I've, I've kind of set myself times for the different sections. And after each section we'll stop and have a discussion, you can ask questions and things. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly say a couple of minutes on what understanding society is, because this is not really the purpose of today to tell you about the study, uh, but to talk about the kind of social and biological um, questions and data and what some of the issues are in analysing them. So a little bit on that. Then I'm going to talk about why we think at Understanding Society, why we've invested in these kinds of data, why it's useful to have biological and social data together, the kinds of research questions it enables you to answer. And then kind of work, stop and have a discussion. Maybe you think about some research questions you might be interested in answering if you could have those kinds of data. Then I'm going to say a bit about what the actual data are that we have in uh, Understanding Society and some of the issues that you need to think about in, under, in analysing those data that you perhaps wouldn't think about with a kind of normal social variable to kind of think about what some of the uh, different kinds of challenges are to having these kinds of data. And then we've got two initiatives at the moment uh, we're doing in Understanding Society, some uh, fellowships and ways of designing experiments to think about collecting these data that you could get involved in if you want to. So I'll say a little bit about that at the end. And I should say that because Melinda is here, I'm going to be talking about genetics and social science uh, later. Although Understanding Society has genetics data, that Melinda might be using it, uh, I'm not really going to talk about that at all other than uh, one slide to say what we have. Um, so very briefly, Understanding Society is a household panel study. It's multi-purpose, covers a, a range of different domains. Um, and it began in 2009 and we collect data annually from everybody in the household. So at wave one, the target was to interview everybody in 40,000 households, which was about 100,000 uh, people. It builds on incorp and incorporates BHPS. So BHPS was set up in 1991 and 8,000 households from BHPS were moved into Understanding Society at Wave 2. So for that 8,000 households, you've got data uh, going back now uh, 25 years. <coughs> it's funded by ESRC and government departments, including uh, DWP, who are here as in the room and one of our funders. And so we work quite closely with government in terms of trying to think about how uh, the data can be useful for policy purposes. It's a public data set, so you can download it from the data archive, and most people who use it are academics, but um, government and third sector and some commercial people use it as well. And it's part of a family of household um, panel studies. So in the UK, we have this rich tradition of longitudinal studies that are mainly about birth cohorts, but internationally, understanding society and things like PSID in the States and HILDA in Australia, um, there are these household, household panel studies that have been set up in similar ways so that you can do comparative research, although we're the only one at the moment that has uh, biological data. So Understanding Society has five different samples and only two of them have the biological data. So that's kind of what the rest of this talk will be about. But just to mention... Uh, them all now. Um, there's a general population sample, so that's a, a stratified sample of the whole population. Then there were about 32, no, 26,000 households, 41,000 interviews in that sample at wave one. At wave one as well, there was an ethnic minority boost, and so that the aim of that was to get representative data on a large enough sample of the five, ma five main ethnic groups in the UK so that you could analyse differences uh, between ethnic groups effectively. But they, a decision was made at the time not to do the biological data on that sample, and, and so we Although in the general population sample there are ethnic minorities who we've collected the biological information on, we didn't do it in the boost samples. BHPS I've already mentioned and we did collect the biological data for them. There's an innovation panel which I'll come back to at the end about experimentation. So that's where we do lots of experiments before we try things out or before we do things in the main study to make sure that they work. Um, and then finally Last year, we added a second immigrant and ethnic minority boost sample to reboost numbers 
of the main ethnic groups and to draw in new immigrant groups that have moved to the UK since we started. And so the kinds of things you might want to think about in thinking about how you would use understanding society for your research or what makes it different is it it's a representative sample of everybody. So when we come to talk about these biological data, we have it on everyone over the age of 16. So you kind of think about how things differ in different parts of the population. It's an annual study, so everyone gets interviewed annually, but it's continuous. So you can use it to think about before and after things. So we happened to ask the EU Brexit question uh, last year. So some people are now doing analyses of kind of people's attitudes before and after uh, the referendum result. I've already mentioned BHPS. Um, everybody in the interview is interv sorry, everyone in the interview. Everyone in the household is interviewed. So you can think about how does, you know, a mum's employment affect the kids or affect her husband, uh, either at the same time or over time. It's a large sample, which means that we have enough people for you to look at subgroups of the population. So it was designed so that there's 10,000 people per decade of age that we get about 500 new births a year. So there's a kind of whole range of things you can do to look at specific groups that you might be interested in. It includes the four countries of the UK. And so as different countries introduce policies in different ways, you can kind of think about how you might be able to compare them um, to, to look at the things you're interested in. So you've got kind of natural experiments going on because of devolution uh, and other uh, differences. I've mentioned uh, the booth samples. We do link to um, administrative data, or we do ask consent to link to administrative data. We're already linked to education data. That's what you're interested in. And I met um, Graham, Mike's colleague, at reception last night, and he tells me it will be linked to DWP <coughs> by, can I say, by March. Well, but we will see whether that's real. But we're well on the way to linking to DWP data, hopefully. Um, I talked about the innovation panel briefly, and I'll come back to the end, that at the end in terms of uh, what we're doing in terms of health experiments. So I'm not going to give you a chance to ask me questions about understanding society, because that's not what uh, this talk's really about. If you do have questions, so kind of in breaks and things, I'm happy to uh, uh, answer them. And I answered lots of questions over dinner last night about personality scales, I seem to remember. Um, OK, so... The reason that understanding society and, and more generally we think it's really important to bring biological and social data together is that in the biological world, uh, it, sorry, in the medical world, people have this really rich information on people's health, but they tend to incorporate kind of one measure of socioeconomic status and think that they're looking at, at kind of how social uh, factors affect health. In contrast, in social sciences, we often have self-report data where we might have one measure that says over the last 12 months has your health been good, fair or poor. So we kind of treat health as a unitary concept. And then we have really rich information on people's social, de uh, social situation. Uh, but, but kind of how you can then unpick those things when you don't have that richness together is a problem. And so in, in a number of studies, but in understanding society, we felt it was really important to bring those two sides together, to have really rich information on people's health and really rich information on people's socioeconomic status. And so what we've done and what we'll be talking about uh, this in my session this morning is we have what are called biomarkers. So biomarkers are objective measures of biological processes and it may be a normal process. I mean, it's normal. There's a no kind of normal distribution. We can all breathe and it measures how much we can breathe. Um, but obviously, one of the key things we do is to indicate where there's a problem, to use those measures to think who is it that has a problem with their lung function or whatever the measure is. So a biomarker may be a measure. So your height is a biomarker. Um, we then take different physical measures. So that's kind of blood pressure, lung function, those kinds of things. And then perhaps the one we most focus on <coughs> is that we take blood samples and then we use them to identify different biomarkers that either measure kind of um, diseases you might have, so diabetes or something, or how high your cholesterol is or what your liver function is. So a whole set of markers for different physiological systems. 
And the reason we think it's really useful to do this in a social survey, as I said, it's about having richness on both sides of the kind of uh, thing we're interested in, um, is because biomarkers give us earlier, more precise and objective measures of people's health and illness. So we can identify, and I'll show you some data on this in a minute, um, for example, whether or not people have diabetes before they actually know they have diabetes. And so that kind of means that you can look at the whole distribution of people who might have a health problem, uh, not just those who've experienced it and gone to a GP and had it diagnosed. Um, it means we can look at things that are predicting people's risks for ill health in the future and therefore we can think about kind of what we can do to prevent that. What are the intervention points if we know at what stage these biomarkers start to look a bit high or abnormal in some way. Given that we can kind of look at things before they manifest themselves into illness and disease, we can start to think about some of the pathways that might link people's social factors to their health or their health to their social factors. So we un if we think that stress, for example, is a key way that social factors uh, might influence your health, we can start to think about biomarkers that we think would be particularly affected by stress and look at whether those things are changing before, uh, you know, sort of between seeing a difference in people's social circumstances and seeing a change in their health. Um, by looking at the genetic side of the data that we have, you can start to think about, you know, are there some biological underpinnings to some of the social things that we, uh, uh, or some of the things we think are of social, and I'm I'm assuming Melinda might be talking about that, and also gene-environment interaction. So it may not be that uh, your genetics are affecting something directly, but they're interacting with something else. So, for example, we know that there's a kind of gene-environment interaction for uh, pollution and lung function. So some people are more susceptible <coughs> to lung function problems um, if they're in situations of pollution. And then... Although your genes don't change at all in your life, there's something called epigenetics, which is how those genes get switched on and off or altered uh, because of things that happen to you uh, during your life. And that's uh, something we have data on, and I will be giving you an example of that in a minute. So although your genetics stays the same, epigenetics means that whether or not those genes work properly um, may change. And a lot of this, thinking about why we might be interested in this, is about kind of how it is we can intervene to address the way in which people's social factors impact on their health or their health impacts on social factors. And I've said that already. So what I'm going to do now is give you a series of examples that I hope illustrate some of those points about the value of having this more objective, more precise um, measures of health or when we're trying to understand how people's social lives and health interact with each other. Does anyone want to ask any questions yet? So the first thing is that um, we can start to think about how... As I said, people's different aspects of health develop and decline in your life. And there is a kind of natural process to that. You know, in early life, for example, your lung function develops and your um, body mass and all uh, muscles do. So kind of in this early stage of your life, different kinds of biomarkers or different kinds of physiological systems are developing. And at some point you reach a peak and then... Gradually, as you get older, those things tend to decline. Um, there are some which go the other way. But anyway, and so that we can think about that in terms of, you know, what might be, if you're disadvantaged, it may be that you're on this, you, you don't rise as high or you decline more quickly. And you can start to think about when those things are happening in people's lives and what you can do about them. So this um, graph is about grip strength. So grip strength is a, a machine at the top. And you squeeze it really hard and it gives you a measure of your upper body strength. But that's a really good predictor of frailty and mortality in later life. And this just shows you the grip strength for <coughs> men and women. Um, so men uh, have much stronger grip strength than women. 
it peaks a bit higher, so kind of in the late 30s. Um, but women seem to decline a bit more slowly. And then when you look at socioeconomic groups, <coughs> the differences aren't quite as stark as this gender difference. Um, but there's the same sort of thing. It, more disadvantaged pe people peak earlier and then they decline more quickly. And so that kind of helps you to start to think about, as I say, different uh, intervention points. A different example, so this is CRP, I'm going to talk about this a bit later, but this is a measure of inflammation and inflammation is one of the ways that we think uh, stress may kind of affect your biological systems and uh, hence, hence go on to create uh, ill health. And uh, higher values of CRP are bad. Um, and what this shows is the difference in CRP across the whole lifespan um, for people with different educational qualifications. So um, this kind of olive green colour um, is people with no qualifications. And so although earlier in life um, they start with low CRP, so it's not that bad uh, compared to the other groups, um, by the time they hit their 30s, they've become much higher. Um, and then that stays really high uh, throughout the kind of middle life, uh, old life. And then where this begins to decline here is probably much more an issue about selective mortality than it is about their CRP levels getting better. And in contrast, those people with a degree, they kind of stay low pretty much uh, throughout that whole period. So again, we can kind of see how these social differences in biomarkers that are not necessarily manifesting themselves in ill health yet kind of emerge quite early in life um, and then get uh, worse or get the, the gap between people gets worse. So another example starting to think about how we bring this together with social data is to think about we, why is it that people might have a biomarker or might have a disease but then don't report it or don't um, yeah don't know, aren't aware of it or, or don't engage with health services as a way of treating it so it may be that um, people might have the example I'm using is diabetes might have diabetes but they're not really picking up on the symptoms of it and so they're not therefore going to a GP to try and get it treated or to see what's wrong and get it treated. They might be aware of that they have these symptoms, they're tired, a bit lethargic or whatever, but be really busy or distracted by other problems in their lives and hence not go and um, seek treatment. It may be that they've sought treatment, they know they're <coughs> diabetic, the GP has told them they need to change their lifestyles and diets and things to kind of manage that diabetes, but they don't manage to do that. Or it may be that GP gives them medication, but they kind of don't adhere to the, the medication regime and therefore, you know, kind of that's not working well. So there's a whole set of social factors you can think in the natural history of a disease and getting it treated that might impact on kind of what actually is going on underneath in terms of the biology and what people are experiencing uh, on the surface. So this is... Um, looking at diabetes that's both measured in terms of a biomarker and is a kind of people's self-report. So the left-hand kind of bluey purple bar, that's the biomarker. So about slightly over 4% of women and 6% of men uh, in understanding society have a biomarker that indicates their blood sugar levels suggests that they have diabetes. The red bars are those people who tell us they have diabetes. Um, the green bars are those people who were taking medication that was for diabetes. And so the grey bar is someone who has any one of those things. And then when you kind of break that up, what you find is that quite a lot more men than women know they have diabetes but are poorly managing it, i.e. they're taking medication or they've been told to address, uh, adjust their lifestyle, but they're not actually doing that enough to keep their blood sugar levels below the kind of at-risk level. Um, the red bar are those people who, according to their blood levels, have diabetes, but they're not 
you know, they don't know about it. They haven't told us they've got it. They're not on medication that suggests they've got it. So they probably don't know that they have it. The green bars are the kind of people who are OK. They've got diabetes, but they're managing it well. They're keeping, they, they know they have it. They may or may not be on medication, um, but they are managing it well. Their blood sugar level suggests that everything's under control. And the orange bar are people who, um, these are the people who were on diabetes medication but didn't tell us they had it. So they kind of don't know that they have it or, well, yeah, so they haven't, um, they don't seem to be aware of it. Maybe they're on kind of lots of different medications for different things and they don't know, or maybe they chose not to tell us. But for whatever reason, they were being treated for diabetes but they didn't tell us about it in the survey. And when you look at that by um, social class, perhaps, not surprisingly, what you see is that um, poorly managed diabetes, so those people who know they've got it, they might be on medication, but they're not doing enough to keep, it's the, the way they're managing it isn't doing enough to keep their sugar levels low, uh, is much more likely, or is much less likely, amongst those with degrees or A-levels than with those with no qualifications. Undiagnosed diabetes, kind of, there doesn't seem to be such a social gradient in it. So the next example I wanted to give is around that question that those of us in social science have analysed for a very long time, overall, well, over the last 12 months, how do you rate your health? Excellent, good, fair or poor? And we know that variable is <coughs> really well associated with different levels of mortality and morbidity and use of health services. So it's a really good single question to predict kind of a whole set of other things to do with health. But we also know there's systematic biases in it. And that kind of worries us when we are using it as a way of allocating resources or, or thinking about need. So if you think about, if, you, if I was to ask you that question now, what would happen, so the psychologists tell us, is that the first thing you would do is think about what, if I say overall how is your health, you'd first of all think about what is health, what do I mean by health, what's my health? And you'd then think, well, how is my health compared to the people I'm sat with, my family, people of my age, what I need to do today? Um, and then you would look at the scale you're presented with, which generally is a kind of five point scale, and you'd pick a point. And you'd do all that in, you know, milliseconds kind of thing. So that's kind of how you answer that question. And, and yet we treat that as very much this measure that predicts everything. So you kind of in that momentary assessment, you make a really good assessment of how your health is. But we do know that there are differences. Uh, by social groups. So what we try to do is say, well, can the biomarkers help us understand what those differences are? Are there different kinds of biomarkers that represent different kinds of health, uh, that measure different kinds of health, that might help us understand why it is that people systematically answer this question differently? And so we grouped the biomarkers we had into these different groups. So first of all, there were what we called visible biomarkers. So your your BMI, your waist circumference, how much body fat you've got. Um, so that was one set. We then looked at things that were about your physical fitness, how well you feel you can function. So your heart rate, your grip strength, that measure I just talked about, and lung function, because that kind of is about how you can be physically active. There were then a set of measures that we think really are a proxy or a way of looking at fatigue. So if you feel tired and kind of lethargic, so the inflammatory markers, we've got markers of anemia and we've got a marker for a kind of immune um, uh, problem. And then we then looked at those markers that are about disease. So, for example, if you have high blood pressure and you've reported you've got it or you're taking medication, we noted that as something that you know you have a disease. Because if you know you have a disease, you might report that question, answer that question differently to if you don't know you have a disease. So then the, the, that was the disease known group and then was there was the disease not known group. So those people who have high measures on these different things but haven't told us they've got it. 
And so then we looked at the literature to think, well, who would we expect to report these things systematically differently? So um, Mildred Blackster, a really famous uh, medical sociologist, did this work where she talked to people about their health and what it meant to be healthy. And so, for example, from that literature, we might predict that women uh, think of their visible kind of biomarkers, their visible body, uh, as being more important for their health than men, whereas men might think of fitness being more important in when they think about answering that question about health than women. And so we have hypotheses all the way through about kind of who these different kinds of biomarkers might matter more to when answering the question about health. So kind of... <coughs> um, what other things? So, yeah. So the other kind of measured, uh, hypotheses we have were that fatigue might be uh, more relevant to women than men, to older people than younger people, that disease might, knowing you have a disease, might be... Uh, more relevant amongst older people and people on high income groups. And our main assumption about having a disease and not knowing it was that if you didn't know you have a disease, the relationship with this self-report health variable uh, would be weaker than for the uh, knowing you had a disease. And some of what we found, some of what we found was that this was right. It is true that there's a much stronger correlation between visible biomarkers and self-report health for women than men and for younger people than older people, um, that physical fitness is more important for men in reporting their health uh, than for women, uh, and so on. But, but they weren't all, our hypotheses weren't all true, and some of those we were a bit puzzled about. So, for example... If you don't have, if you have a disease and you don't know about it, you will, there is a much stronger correlation than if you have a disease and you do know about it. Now, you might actually think, well, actually, there is a kind of logic there. If you have a disease, you know it, you're managing it because you're on medication, you might discount that a bit in the way you answer that health question than if here you're experiencing symptoms associated with, bio, uh, with having high blood pressure or... or whatever it is, but you don't know about it. So it may be that some of our hypotheses were perhaps not right, rather than um, the findings being counterintuitive. But nevertheless, the point really in telling you about this here is that having the biomarkers enables us to start thinking about what is it about the way people think about their health that might um, be systematically different amongst different social groups. So the next example I wanted to give you is this thinking about whether having these objective measures of health can help us have a bit more confidence when we think about how social factors and health might be related. And so this example is about work and health. And so we know when you look at kind of uh, data more generally that people who are in work tend to have better health than people who are unemployed. And so we assume that returning to work is going to improve people's health. Um, and that, you know, the big part of some of the government's programmes and, and things is very much saying that, that this is the case. But then there's another literature that says not all work is good for health, that there are different aspects of work that might um, be negatively associated with your health. And most of the existing literature that's looked at this has been based on self-report health data and self-report data about the quality of work. So you might on the same day be asked, overall, how is your health? And, you know, do you feel you have much control in your work? And so you can imagine that if you're kind of um, a very positive person, you might answer those things quite positively. And, and if you're a less positive person, you might answer both those things uh, uh, negatively and so kind of there's a lot of criticism of this literature and in terms of thinking about policies that that push this idea um it's kind of based on this problematic assumption or problematic kind of investigation but biomarkers might give us objective measures in order to kind of look at this question and then we haven't got that problem about both parts of the association being based on self-report data 
And so this is a um, project led by Tarani Chandola. And, and what he did was he looked at people <coughs> in understanding society who are out of work in one wave and went back to work in the next wave and compared them with the people who stayed unemployed in the two waves. And the measure uh, of biomarkers that he used is something called allostatic load. So allostatic load is about the, the way that stress over time impacts on your physiological system. So it's a, a set of about eight different biomarkers over three or four different physiological systems. And it's meant to kind of measure the cumulative burden on you of um, kind of having stress over your lifetime. <coughs> so the first bar is um, the predicted level of allostatic load, so high is bad for those people who remained employed between two different waves. And so their allostatic load's about 2.7 or something. If someone moved into what was classified as a good quality job in terms of questions that they answered <coughs> about their control at work and um, different things like that, then their allostatic load was much lower. So that, well, much lower. It was lower. It's not significantly lower, but it was lower. So that implies that possibly moving into a good quality job is a positive thing um, in terms of health. But if you had a poor quality job on a number of different measures, then it looked like that actually kind of was worse for your health. So, you know, there are a range of things that could be explaining this. It could be that um, the type of job that people go into, depending on their kind of pre-existing health conditions, might be explaining this. But Tarani did uh, control for health before, uh, this he looked at a whole set of things that might you might think be due to selection effects and looked at income and education differences a whole way a range of ways of trying <coughs> to ensure that the differences he's, he was looking at were more about um, the, the change of employment status than kind of kind of background factors for people so then my Last example before stopping and having a, a discussion about some of this is about this idea that your, although your genetics don't change, your environment might impact on the way in which the genes control biological functions in your body. So the epigenetics is a way of measuring uh, something called methylation, which looks at the extent to which your genes, have, each individual genes, have been turned on or off or harmed in some way that stops them working properly. And one of the big things that people have been doing in epigenetics is creating what's called an epigenetic clock. And so the idea of this is to look at how much different parts of your uh, genome have been affected by methylation, by this turning things on and off, as a way of measuring biological ageing, this kind of idea that, you know, if you're more disadvantaged, you might biologically age faster uh, than more advantaged people. And so there's a particularly uh, famous clock in epigenetics created by Steve Horafath, and um, it's based on epigenetics measured in blood, which is what we've done. And it's based on a number of 353 markers. <coughs> and we had 17 of them missing. So there's kind of some issues about that. And this clock has been shown to be really strongly associated with a range of what you might think of as ageing conditions. <coughs> and so the first thing we did <coughs> is, sorry, is just look at kind of how this measure of biological ageing based on epigenetics um, is associated with actual chronological ageing. And you can see that it's, um, so the, <coughs> the, the red line is just kind of where the two things equal and the green line is the, the fitted uh, model for the, for the actual data. And so you can see they tend to diverge, particularly at the kind of ends of the age ranges. And, you know, part of that might be that many of the studies that have looked at epigenetics before have been on quite narrow age ranges or quite small samples. And so having this really big 
kind of age range um, in understanding society it kind of enables you to, to look at it along the whole age distribution, not just in selected groups or selected groups uh, with health problems. I should say that we, because I'm telling you about the data later, so that we only have epigenetics data for about 1,100 people, which perhaps doesn't sound very big in a social science setting, but it is one of the biggest kind of data sets on epigenetics there is at the moment. So um, what this suggests is perhaps that the way the clock has been calculated till now may not take into account what you would expect in a kind of normal general population. But when you use the clock to look at whether or not it's associated with socioeconomic circumstances, so whether there is a correlation between people's social disadvantage and how much the methylation has changed uh, in, in ways that are affecting people's biological ageing, what you find is that there's a significant association um, for childhood socioeconomic status. So having grown up in a, a semi-skilled or unskilled or in a household where neither parent are working, then your epigenetic clock is likely to be much older, significantly older, than if you grew up in a house where uh, your parents were more affluent. But that you don't see the same association, they're not significant, <coughs> uh, with a range of measures of current socioeconomic status. This is just, I've just illustrated with one. And so, you know, there is some suggestion which would fit with what we think of biologically, that your circumstances in childhood are when some of the damage might be done to this kind of, these biological um, ageing processes. <coughs> so that is the end of the examples I wanted to share about, you know, why we might want to think about using biomarkers in uh, social science research questions. So I kind of wanted to stop here, give you a chance to ask questions, maybe think about some of the research questions that you could ask with these uh, sorts of data. And then um, I'll go on and talk a bit more about the data and some of the things you need to think about in analysing them. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. So I'm going to say a little bit about the data we collected and then um, about kind of some of the issues you need to think about in analysing these kinds of data. And I've got half an hour, is that right? <coughs> Ten, till 10.30, yeah? Okay, so... <coughs> So when you think about the sorts of biomarkers you might collect, um, as I said, there's kind of physical measures, which some people call biomeasures, like height, blood pressure, grip strength, lung function. And then there's these data that we analyse from, we have analysed in understanding society from blood, but we're looking at doing things in the future where we might take these data from saliva samples, from hair samples, from other bodily fluids that we won't mention. Um, and a whole set of things... Um, and what you do from them is you can collect things that are, or you can identify clinical indicators of disease. So I'm going to give you an example in a minute around uh, chronic kidney disease. Things that are risk factors. So some of the inflammatory markers, they're kind of risk factors. We know they're associated with diseases in the future. Um, things that we think are on the stress pathway. And then there are some kind of novel indicators and I was <coughs> at a meeting the other day and people talk about kind of there's a fashion in biomarkers so a little while ago telomere was all the fashion so that was kind of seen as a way of biological and uh, measuring biological aging and kind of trends have moved on a, a little bit and we have in understanding society examples of all of them so <coughs> what we did was um, we sent a nurse into people's home in wave two for the general population sample and wave three for the British household panel sample, we, as we were just talking about, um, the ethnic minority booths were excluded. You were eligible to take part if you had done the main interview in that wave. You lived in Great Britain, so we didn't do this in Northern Ireland because we couldn't get a nurse uh, workforce in Northern Ireland. And you spoke English. Uh, in your main interview. So we didn't have, where we have translators in the study for the general uh, interview, we, di we didn't have that for the nurse interview. Um, and then there were not enough research nurses in Britain to run this study for understanding society. So we had to kind of take a random sample of people 
um, in order to kind of match the nurse workforce that existed at the time. Um, the nurse interview took place about five months after the main interview. So in the main interview, people were asked, would you like to be followed up with a nurse interview? Um, and, and if they said yes, they were. And the interview and taking all these samples lasted about an hour. And um, not everybody took part. And so one thing, if you're using these data, you need to kind of think about who took part. And I'm struggling to see this table from here, so I'm guessing you might be from down there. But <laughs> um, we have, so 21,000 people almost did the nurse visit, and so they have the physical measures and all those sorts of data. Um, 14,000 people gave blood, and we managed, so sometimes when you give blood, the blood might get kind of not be taken well or it got posted to clinic so kind of it might have got stuck in the post so there are a range of reasons why even if someone gave blood you might not be able to produce uh, some of these analytes and we produced analytes for 13,000 uh, people and I think I've said this before so the physical measures we did were height weight waist circumference body fat a range of measures of your lung function blood pressure, heart rate, grip strength. Um, and then we asked a whole set of questions about what their health was like on the day, what other things they were doing on the day, because as I'll show you later, some of those things affect these measures. And so you need to take them into account when you're analysing them. Um, for the blood samples, um, there are a few people who we couldn't ask to give us blood for different reasons. The cons as we were talking about just now, the consent was for future research. We didn't specify what we were going to do with the blood because at the time we didn't have funds to do anything with the blood. Uh, we asked a separate consent for the genetics to extract DNA and do genetics analysis. There's a, a set of issues around the way the blood was collected that mean only some kinds of <coughs> measures can be produced. So some, some, <laughs> some measures need fresh blood. Uh, but we froze the blood and therefore that kind of limits uh, the things we can do. Um, yeah, you don't need to know the rest. And so the sorts of things, when we got the grant or when we bid for the grant to do these blood analytes, we wanted to think about what researchers might want to do. And so we thought about what biomarkers we should include in that list um, in terms of these sorts of criteria. So where you might expect there to be some kind of environmental uh, factor associated with them, where they were on the pathway to major health conditions that a reasonable proportion of the general population might have so that you would have a big enough sample within understanding society to, <coughs> to do analyses and kind of took, part, you know, took account of the way that we had measured or collected and, and processed the blood. Um, and then we have a, a range of measures. So um, we have kind of lipids, which are kind of ways of measuring how much flat fat there is in your blood. We've talked a lot already about we have this measure of uh, blood sugar. Um, we have inflammatory markers. We have a marker for um, wear and tear on your immune system some anemia markers that are about poor nutrition, liver function, kidney function, and then a set of different hormones that we think are associated either with development when you're young or decline as you get older. So testosterone is all about building up uh, uh, muscles, kind of about development. And some of the others we have, like DHEES, um, are about kind of the way uh, things decline as you get older. Um, for genetics, we um, use something called a core exome chip. Are you going to be talking about this? A little bit. Oh, okay. Um, and what that means is that so the, you have the whole genome and they identified SNPs along the genome which are really good at predicting other, other kind of SNPs. So they only measured, only measured. 500,000 uh, SNPs, and then they use that to impute 8 million. And so there's kind of a big set of uh, genetics data. The genetics data were done for people who consented to it, and then going back to the kind of 
discussion that was happening earlier, that it was only done for people of white European descent. And that's because <coughs> that this particular chip was designed kind of for that um, population group. For the epigenetics, um, because this was quite expensive, we did it, as I said, for about 1,100 people. And so we wanted to kind of think about the people who it would be most valuable to have these data for. Um, so we obviously had to do it for people who had the genetics data. There were some things about the way the blood was processed that were important. Um, we did it on people in the BHPS and people for whom we had at least 10 years of data in the BHPS because we thought if you were interested in kind of how the environment over time has affected your epigenetics, they might be the people that had the most kind of interesting uh, uh, things that you could look at. And again, um, so we have 1,100 people and about 850 epigenetic sites uh, that the data were collected for. And these numbers sound quite scary, I think, to social scientists. You know, we have 8 million SNPs and 850,000 epigenetic sites. Um, the data are quite straightforward. So the genetics data is either 0, 1 or 2. You don't have this particular SNP. You inherited it from one parent. You inherited it from two. And the epigenetics data are about the proportion of methylation that's taking place. So the number is between 0 and 1. So you have the, you know, huge numbers of these data because you have them for so many different sites on your genome. Uh, but the actual data themselves are quite straightforward to understand. And then there were specialist packages that manage these data, uh, the, the two different data, which are basically based on R. Um, and so kind of then you can extract the information you need, or we would extract the information you need, and then you would get uh, uh, the data, which is what I was just uh, saying about. So you can, if you just want genetics and epigenetics data, you can get it straight away from a genetics archive. I'm guessing that's not interesting to people here. If you want the epigenetics and genetics data <coughs> combined with social data, then you have to apply to a, a committee called the Metadac. And Metadac is across different ESRC studies. And the Metadac look at what you're wanting to do, not in terms of the scientific question, but in terms of whether what you're proposing would be disclosive because of the kind of sensitive nature of the data. And so if it is, they would ask you to think about having different variables as opposed to rejecting your application. Um, and so hopefully then uh, your application would get passed and you would be given the data. I just said all that. Um, so I now wanted to say a little bit about some of the things you need to think about in terms of analysing the data, unless anyone wants to ask a question about what data there are. So when you use biomarker data, um, in addition to kind of the usual things you might think about when considering how to analyse a variable, there are a set of things you need to think about because this is kind of different kind of data. So you need to think about whether there are clinically feasible ranges for this particular measure uh, that you kind of ought to know about. You know, if uh, blood pressure is over 500 or something, it kind of implies that person isn't alive. So it suggests there might be something wrong with those data. Um, so there, there's kind of just a slightly different version to thinking about outliers. Um, you need to think about things that might have happened to the person or um, they might have done close to taking the measure because that might affect the measure and that might affect the measure in terms of the thing you're interested in. Um, so things like if they've had an operation um, then some of the inflammatory markers will be really high because they've had an operation as opposed to because of the things you're interested in. Um, smoking, eating particular things, drinking, all of those might affect some of the, the blood, um, blood pressure results. Um, when and how the blood was taken. So I'm going to show you an example in a minute where we think t the time of day, different groups of the participants in the study might have been interviewed, might be affecting some of the results that we've got. So you kind of need to think about that and control for those things in your analyses. Other conditions, so it may be that you're uh, seeing you know, uh, high levels of a particular biomarker that's not because of the disease you mainly associate with that biomarker but because of something else. So you need to think about comorbidities 
And then medications. Medications are both used by people to control diabetes. So, you know, when you're, if you are analysing diabetes or high blood pressure, what do you do about those people who are actually taking medications to control those things? And then what do you do if you're analysing something else, but you know that actually high blood pressure medication might affect it? So there are kind of things like that that you need to think about. And then there are some things that kind of might help with us. So for some conditions, there are internationally agreed ways of uh, standardising and, and using these data. And so what we've done for every one of the uh, biomarkers available in Understanding Society, we've got a glossary that goes through all those things and tells you what you need to worry about. And that's on our website. So to give you um, a couple of examples, so I won't do this one, I'll do the next one. So, oh, um, ferritin is a measure of uh, iron that's stored in your blood. And so it's quite important in terms of, you know, anemia. That's kind of what you think of in terms of iron in the blood. And um, poor anemia or low levels of anemia is generally, associated, uh, generally very high in women. Uh, it's associated with fatigue and other things. But actually, one thing you need to think about is often with some of these measures, both ends of the distribution indicate that there's a problem. So with anemia, we tend to think about it as being low iron in the blood is a problem and hence the kind of uh, groups in society and, and other things that are associated with it. But actually, for, there's another kind of problem associated with iron, which is having far too much iron in the blood. And that tends to be much more common in men and then is associated with subsequent heart disease. So this is what um, there are <coughs> clinical cutoffs for this that are in the guide. And this is what it looks like. So for men, iron overload is much more of an issue and it increases with age. And for women, iron depletion or low levels of iron are much more important that decreases uh, with age. Um, so this next biomarker I wanted to talk about is just again, it's just to kind of make you think about the things you need to think about. Um, Testosterone. So this is a hormone associated with um, growth and development, um, building muscle strength. And there's quite a lot of interest in it in social science. So it was associated with the stock market crash. It's seen as a kind of male social behaviour. There's been studies using testosterone to look at um, people who are more likely to be self-employed, have higher levels of testosterone. <coughs> Uh, uh, and other things. And because of the way it's measured, you can only really use the data to look at testosterone in men. We don't have the, the test we did, wasn't really high enough to detect uh, levels in women. But this is also the one where time of day matters. So we know that testosterone systematically varies during the day. And uh, we expect testosterone to decline with age for men, but it starts to go up here around 64. <coughs> and we think that's because the way the interviews worked, or we know that's because we looked at it, um, that once you're retired, you tend to be interviewed in the morning or during the day, whereas if you're working, you tend to be interviewed in the evening. So this looks like a really strange example of testosterone not doing what we think it should do, but actually it, you need to kind of think about how that interacts with the way people take part in surveys. There are some of the biomarkers where you kind of need to know how people think about it in the literature in order to, or, or in clinical settings, in order to kind of interpret the data properly or effectively. So kidney disease, there are international standard um, formulae that take the blood marker, uh, blood data that we have, and you kind of have to apply different levels for different age groups and ethnic groups and genders in order to get a measure that indicates whether or not uh, people have kidney disease. And like I say, all this is kind of available in the glossary if you're interested in doing it. It's really just to kind of make you aware there are things you need to think about. And so kind of perhaps not surprising, what you find is that <coughs> high levels of kidney disease uh, increase with age. <coughs> 
so we have um, funding to try and encourage people to use these data and we do various uh, events and provide various resources and so um, a key thing to note if you're interested in this is we currently have a call out for biomarker fellowships so this is funding for up to a year if you wanted to do a project using the biomarker data or the genetics data but the deadline is next Thursday <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is possible if you are interested and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, we then have various workshops that we do again to try and encourage it. So we have a, we're planning a genetics one in February, uh, another biomarker one in April because we've added some new, or by then, we have added some new biomarkers to uh, the, the ones we already have. Uh, Dan Benjamin, who's an economist and runs the uh, Social Science and Genetics Consortium, is coming to do a masterclass late spring um, and then we have a kind of co annual conference that's just about the use of these data that you might be interested in. So, um, there. But we've talked a little bit about the fact that um, we only measured these data once so far and these data were really expensive to collect. But obviously, lots and lots of the questions that you might want to ask, really what you want is to have change in these data. You want change over time. And at the same time as kind of we've collected these data, or since then, we've moved to a way of conducting the main study where some people are only interviewed on the web and some people are interviewed face to face. And so what we've started to think about is how can we collect biomarker data again so we can have effective ways of looking at change so it needs to be comparable to the data we've already collected. But taking into account the fact we'll probably never get funding to do it in the way we did it before, on the whole sample and for lots of our respondents they're not used to having an interviewer come to their house anymore they answer the question on web so can we collect biomarker data that's robust and high quality um, but but nevertheless um, kind of takes account of these different ways of um, collecting the survey we do now and at the same time as kind of thinking about the way the survey world has changed for our respondents technology has changed so Things we could only previously do in blood, we can now do in hair samples. We're really interested in things like microbiome, which uh, requires stool samples. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, can we do things by smartphone and kind of different ways of asking people questions. Do we need nurses? And there's no nurses in the rooms there. Do we need nurses anymore to do uh, data collection for, um, you know, these kind of biological measures? Can, can not ordinary interviewers collect these data. Can respondents collect these data for themselves? And again, we talked a little bit about this earlier. The response rate we got in understanding society to giving blood or doing this nurse interview was a bit lower than some of the medical studies. So is that because if you take part in a medical study, it's very salient to you and therefore you're more likely to be willing to give blood? Or was it that we didn't give feedback? So why would you give us your blood if we're not giving you anything back from it? So there's kind of a set of uh, questions uh, that we're interested in. So in the innovation panel that we have that will go into the field in 2019, we're doing an experiment. It's purely about health and we've got three arms going on. So there's one where people will get a traditional nurse visit, kind of the way we did it before, to get some what you might think of as medical gold standard measures and um, they'll take blood samples and all those sorts of things one where one of our ordinary interviewers will go to the respondents health and do the questionnaire and explain to them all about these different samples and one where the respondent will do the interview on the web and there'll be videos to explain to the respondent how to do these measures themselves so clearly we're not what we're doing is blood spots so if you, i don't know see people who have diabetes they kind of often do one of these pin prick things so you can do that get people to kind of send you the uh, the paper that you press your thumb onto afterwards um, to do some of the same blood analyses that we've already done we're getting people to send us hair samples so you need a bit of your hair from here little only a little bit um, and um, that allows us to collect a whole or analyse a whole set of data around different hormones, exposure to toxins, so kind of lead and all those sorts of things in the atmosphere. 
Um, and then we're also doing an experiment we kind of talked about earlier about whether or not um, we give people feedback. It affects either their willingness to take part or um, subsequent kind of behaviour. Oh. Sorry, I've got a different slide on this thing in front of me. So we have funding to do this. We're really interested in both who is willing to do this kind of data collection in these different ways and what the quality of the data is. That's kind of what we're doing. But next month, December, we're doing a call so that you could propose experiments if you wanted to. Um, so um, we have sort of had some, we had a workshop about this. Some people are thinking about experiments, for example, of where you take a photo of your body and you can use that to measure um, kind of body fat and body size um, in some ways. We talked to people, I think I mentioned, about doing smartphone in the moment, mental health measures. Um, we're talking about um, other um, samples that we might collect and how acceptable it would be to respondents to ask them to give us urine or stool samples because you can kind of get at very different sorts of measures with that. So there's kind of a whole set of things that people are interested in. But this call is open to everybody um, to propose an idea. So we're going to launch it in December. Given this is a bit different to our normal experiments, uh, we're wanting people to say in January if they're interested in doing something. So we can, there's no point you developing a big protocol for how to collect something if we've had 100 people interested because we only have a 50 minute interview. So we'd kind of need to think about how to handle that if we had a lot of interest. But um, the data will be collected in 2019 and be available in 2020. So kind of, if you're interested in experimentation or thinking about how you could do something in your own study and you want to try it somewhere first, that might be the place to go. And that's uh, all I wanted to say. You have any more questions? 